I work with MLA as the Goat Industry Development Manager. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to join today's webinar. Uh, I should let you know that today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, the recording will be uploaded to the MLA website in the coming days so you can view and watch the webinar again and share that, um, that link with anyone who perhaps missed today's webinar and was unable to dial in. If you do have any issues with audio today, there are a couple of ways of listening into the webinar. You can use either your, your computer or you can dial in using your mobile phone or landline. You should see on the screen at the moment we have some information, a phone number and an access code if you did want to dial into the webinar using your phone. Today's webinar is about goat meat market requirements, prices and trends and we have three uh, really exciting guest speakers uh, who have agreed to contribute their time today and do these presentations. Really this is the first of a series of webinars that the goat industry and MLA are running and they are designed to give uh, goat producers across the country an opportunity to, to hear from some speakers who you perhaps might not otherwise uh, be able to get access to and ask questions of those people as well. If you did have any questions for the speakers as we're going through, you'll notice on You'll notice on your uh, teleconference screen there that there is an option for you to uh, type in and ask questions. So if you did have any questions, please feel free to send those through. Uh, I'll be able to view those and ask those of the speakers as well. So we might kick off without further ado. Uh, so our guest speakers today are Mr. Campbell McPhee, owner of Western Meat Exporters. Uh, Western Meat Exporters are one of the largest uh, goat abattoir processors in the country based in Charleville, Queensland. Uh, following on from that we have Mr Blair Bryce who is the Business Development Manager of Wellard Meat Trading based in Western Australia. Uh, Wellards have processed uh, sheep, cattle and goats and um, both, both Campbell and Blair will be available today to give a brief overview of some of I suppose the common questions and, and, and so forth that come up in relation to processing goats and what we might do is hold questions off until both Blair and Campbell have, have completed their presentation and then um, both of them will be able to answer those questions. Following on from that we have Mr Ben Thomas who is a Senior Market Analyst with Meat and Livestock Australia and Ben will be able to provide a bit of an overview of some of the data that MLA collects, trends going forward in terms of processing numbers and so forth and ways you can get access to that information more readily. So without further ado what we might do is kick off with Campbell. Uh, so what I'll do Campbell I'm just going to uh, unmute you and we will open up your presentation for everyone to view. So Campbell are you online? Yes Julie can you hear me? Yes I can. Great. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, listening to us today. Um, Western Meat Exporters is situated in Charleville, South West Queensland. Uh, it's a totally Australian owned private company processing solely goats. It's the only abattoir which is processing solely goats. The company was established in 1997 with the main purpose of uh, building a facility designed to produce halal goat meat to meet export markets around the world. It's a 100% export. Uh, and it's the largest processor in Australia. 97% uh, of what we process is rangeland goats. Uh, we employ close to 200 people through two companies, Western Med Exporters and our transport company, Charleville Transport Services, which also deliver goats and export, uh, and take our containers to Brisbane daily, which is around about 60 tonne per day we produce. We are licensed to uh, export to nearly every corner of the world. Um, main market's been USA, China, Korea, Canada, you know, the, um, also we also have a license for the EU and we also do send quite a bit of product into the Caribbean. Um, 
over the, over the period of time that I've been involved with the business, the, uh, we've seen a lot of change in our marketing, which has moved us away from a skin on skin off market towards a skin on plant. Uh, with the vast majority of our goats going skin on, which has made us move away from the USA a little bit and uh, create new markets in Asia, and also with China coming on board with, uh, and also Korea looking more t towards goat meat. Um, the skin on market seem to be growing, which is uh, certainly suits us and, and suits our um, our grazers who supply us goats. Um, some of the uh, products that we have produced over the years has been uh, a straight skin on carcass or a, a skin on carcass which will go into a carton. We also do a Q product in all, in also the uh, we do a skin off. We, we used to do a lot of more skin off than what we do now. We also do a burnt goat, which all these products can be done into a sort of cut cartons, also done into a cube packaging. But uh, since uh, we've moved the business more into a ninety into a skin on process, we've had to change our tact, and a lot of our process now is relies on carcass meat going straight into Asia. The volumes that we are doing around that we try to aim for three thousand three hundred per day, which will give us just under sixteen thousand per the week. Um, last year we were because of the dry conditions and we end up processing uh, 660,000. Uh, we were on target to beat that again this year but the uh, late surge of winter into the western division of New South Wales and Queensland has eased up the supply a little bit but we'll, uh, we're certainly looking at getting back on track. The, uh, we source goats mainly from, uh, from New South Wales and Queensland. We uh, probably we would work on a radius probably a thousand kilometres to the north up towards Mutterborough and also we're collecting boats to, from Broken Hill to Cobar, from Hillston and everywhere in between. Um, there's a few things that can affect our volume. volume. So, but the main thing is always in this western country has always been the weather. When the weather's good for, for rain and, and there's also, the, you know, obviously with the dirt tracks it affects it quite, people don't muster a lot when there's a lot of water about. Um, and you know, I would say that mainly weather is our, 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 uh, our main effect that can reduce our volumes. Uh, other things that would affect volumes of throughput would be the quality of goats. If there's been a, a, quite a lean season, you know, we'll, we'll slow down our speed and we'll also uh, so we can take better care of the products and not to damage a lighter carcass. Um, also, there's kidding when the, there's a lot of kidding of uh, uh, females around, a lot, a lot of people will leave those goats alone and not master for those few months, obviously to get the advantage of having extra stock on the ground, so that will affect volumes during certain times of the year. Um, when the goats are coming out of uh, from winter to summer, they're obviously going to change their coats and for our skin on process, that can affect how the speed they can go through the chain, so changing of a coat from winter to spring can have a large effect. Um, and also the uh, other thing that can affect volumes is uh, increased demand from other uh, sheep abattoirs who are, you know, occasionally decide to start doing a few goats um, and they, they put a, lot, a bit more pressure on the job and they can affect the supply but usually we, we get our share. Um, things that producers can do to help processes to help their outcomes, um, probably the, the number one thing that producers can do to help uh, would be, the first one I would put there would be the NVDs and respecting uh, the NVD and what it does. It, um, it's basically the only thing separating us from uh, having to tag all goats to work. So any uh, any improvements we can do in respecting the NVD for what it is, it's certainly uh, going to keep our um, exemption, which I'm sure is important to a lot of us. The um, We do get audited from US and EU markets. They, they will come out and pull out a carcass or pull out a carton and ask us where this goat has come from. And uh, we have been audited and they do, we, we are able to use the traceability to, to trace it back to farm um, and the, uh, the use of the MVDs over the last 10 years has improved but we, we always kind of let people know that it's uh, very important that we respect the, the traceability of the, of the goats. Uh, other things that suppliers can do, um, contact the supplier or the depot which they uh, are looking at providing the goats to. Um, if they're looking at doing a muster, let us know in advance so we can uh, make sure there's space on, on, on for the kill as well as um, 
if you're doing a muster, if, uh, if they thought they were going to get certain numbers, there's been a change to those numbers, either increasing or decreasing, let the supplier, if the supplier can let the uh, depot or the abattoirs know that the, uh, the numbers have changed so we can move our transport around. I mean, it's still quite common that we will get a phone call saying the uh, the goats are. Uh, I've got goats in the yard. Can you come and get them? And, uh, and when we're already full, we can make things a bit awkward. Um, but you know, we do our best to meet everyone's needs. The um, and if they've had rain, uh, contact the, uh, the livestock buyer and let them know there's been rain on the road. And been buying goats from a thousand k's of radius. The uh, the conditions can be quite different. So if they can do it. Check, make sure the roads are open, goats to be picked up. Uh, also, another thing, water retention in, in goats can be different from the summer to winter. We um, we hope that you know, people do uh, lock up their goats off water before transport. And this will you know, allow the goats to arrive dry and clean and uh, without cre creating a slip and a trip hazard on the, on the trucks themselves. Uh, in winter, with the greater retention, um, we have a, there is a, an ability to lock them up for a longer period, um, and long as they have that 12-hour kind of window for transport, the uh, the ghosts will be here in, in, in fine condition. The um, the summer period, obviously, you will lock them up for less time. It's, it's a bit of a, we do have a, like a 48-hour window we can work with. But this really comes back to common sense and knowing your stock, knowing your yards, knowing the shade that you can provide, knowing how hard the muster was on the stock. So it's really something that. I'm sure most grazers can can see and make a decision how long they need to lock their stock off, but just in the winter they can lock them up a long period because the water retention is greater and they they, they tend to hold the water and, and lot wetter trucks coming in for the winter periods. Um, animal welfare is another big issue at the moment with uh, the rise of uh, a lot of welfare groups. Um, welfare standards with the maturing of the the goat industry has certainly increased and. Uh, and continues to, to get better and better, um, but the, the window for error is uh, smaller and smaller. So we keep um, pressing the issues regarding if you know, people can draft goats to size for transport, which will make it better for uh, better for the, the goats inside the trucks. Uh, pregnant nannies, if they can be separated, uh, any small goats, anything that, which may become a, a trip hazard uh, when the goats have been transferred, like small goats, or small kids uh, inside a truck, pregnant nannies that may go down. Uh, wet goats, all those type of things which uh, affect the animal welfare, even the loading of goats using uh, using dogs to load goats or to muster. Um, know your dogs, if a dog uh, is likely to bite, a muzzle is probably preferable. If not, uh, if your dogs, are, uh, if most farmers know their dogs, if they're only going to bark, will they going to be fine or they think they're going to be an issue, to put them on the back. You a lot of goats run well without them. So. Um, we could have washed the dog bites, but they show up very quickly on the on the kill floor. Um, make sure the animals are fit to load. Uh, the conditions of the goats are uh, of of, uh, of of a standard that they can be transported, um, which is which is the main things regarding our welfare. But I think overall, the uh, most grazers are, are getting it right, and the uh, and the conditions that they're, they're setting the goats in are getting better and better each year. I mean, the future of the goat industry certainly matured. The worldwide demand certainly gone forward with it all. The uh, with the new freedom agreement, agreements coming in from Korea and China. Uh, now people are looking towards India to come part of it. Um, we've got more orders coming out of these countries for uh, the skin on goats, just on the back of free trade agreements which haven't been even ratified at this stage. Um, Korea and China have import taxes of for sheep and goat meat you know, around that 22 percent. So. If they're already starting to show a large uh, interest now, the future is certainly uh, going to be bright if if, um, if every, all the uh, free trade agreements get ratified. Um, we've got the type of goats that they like. They're nice and lean. Um, you know, not so much fat cover. They're uh, they don't have a large tape to them. Um, they're very uh, they're very they're very happy for the market. They come out a lovely white skin when the skin for the skin on market. So. Our main job lately has been increasing the size of the skin on market because uh, the skin on market for us, uh, it, it keeps us with uh, uh, better kilos for us to sell. There's also better kilo, kilos for the grazers to sell. So um, we found with the skin on market, we, you know, farmers can increase the returns up to up to 50% yields and over, 
a number of goats on a truck, it, it works out to be quite a bit. With, with some of the larger goats, it can be up to four kilos heavier than skid off. So if we keep increasing the size of our export market with the skin on markets, it would be better for processors and producers. Um, I think that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Campbell. Um, as I mentioned at the, the start of the webinar, we might just hold questions off until Blair Bryce has concluded his presentation as well. Um, and if you have joined the webinar a little bit late, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the Meat and Livestock Australia website uh, in the coming week. So you will be able to revisit it and watch it there. So uh, what we might do now is head on over to Blair Bryce and get his presentation up and running. So Blair, I'm just on um, you and changing you to the presenter. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Uh, again, thanks everyone for jo joining us today. Um, appreciate the time that you've uh, given up to um, to listen to us today. Um, Bowfoot River Meats is part of the Wellard Group, um, which we're probably more better known for our live export operations. Wellard's got into uh, meat processing, goat processing, you know, about two years ago. Um, basically, our operation is located. Um, in the um, southwest of WA, uh, about sort of 300 k south east of Perth, um, we process anywhere up to 17 to 1800 goats in a day, um, and we predominantly or we have a skin-off process, um, and most of those carcasses are being primarily uh, produced into either whole carcass or assorted six-way uh, cuts. Um, you'll see. On this current slide, um, there's roughly about 10, 10,500 goat producing properties throughout Australia. Each of those red dots represents an area where goats are um, taken from. But to put WA into a bit of context, um, ultimately um, there's only about 825 um, properties in Western Australia that sort of currently produce goats. Um, on average, about 75% of all of Australia's goat meat comes out of that. Eastern states area, so the the western New South Wales, southwest Queensland, South Australia. So that is the, the real engine room for the goat industry. Over here in WA, it's probably around about 20 percent, and I think it's probably dropped in the last year or two. Um, but ultimately, about 95 percent of Australia's goats come out of the rangeland. So it's, the rangeland really does drive the uh, goat production, and it's no different here in Western Australia. We buy all of our goats over the hooks. Um, and as you can see there, um, it's very seasonal. Um, we do get the majority of our goats in the warmer part of the year, so usually from about October, November onwards, the goats start to uh, become available, um, and ultimately that will extend through to normally around about March. Um, we purchase predominantly 12 kilo, cus, uh, 12 kilo plus carcass weight, which is really around about a 30 kilo live weight. Um, Anything that's under a 10 kilo carcass is deemed a non-commercial value. Um, so producers really want to make sure that they are taking off that very light end of the um, of the draft. We um, also prefer, uh, if possible, that if they can uh, draft the lines into probably over 34 kilo live weight and below 34 kilo live weight or thereabouts, that certainly helps us in regards to setting up our processing lines and certainly um, will assist the producer in making sure that uh, Small goats aren't mixed in with larger goats. Most of our production is headed towards North America, so to the US and to Canada. Um, we do obviously uh, send a little bit to the West Indies, Trinidad, um, but also to Indo-Asia, Taiwan, Philippines, and over into Mauritius. We've recently been given our China license, so we expect China to, to feature quite prominently on that graph in the coming year. Um, but certainly um, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to go forward with. 
Uh, the Philippines is um, a good little niche market for us on the back of we have a beef abattoir located in the Philippines. So um, we, uh, as a bit of an addition to our beef sales up there, quite a lot of uh, Filipinos have been asking us for goats once they realise that we produce them. So we've been sending a bit of product into the Philippines. As I pointed out before, um, we do both carcass and um, assorted cuts. Um, but as you'll see from that graph there, that the majority of the cuts are, or the majority of the production is towards assorted cuts. Um, it's, it's a commodity protein goat meat at the end of the day. Um, and it feeds a, a very large variety of uh, ethnic populations within countries and around the world. Uh, it is the most widely eaten meat in the world. Um, and consequently, we package it in the most economical form, um, and that's usually into a cart and there's a six-way um, on assorted cuts. Um, interestingly, the, the market has been, uh, as Campbell pointed out, been continually developing. Um, we get all sorts of inquiries recently. We, on the back of our chilled air freight lamb carcass program, um, we've had inquiries from some of our customers now for chilled uh, goat carcasses. Um, the only problem is that trying to get um, small, consistent lines of, um, of goats for um, air freight uh, has been quite difficult here in Western Australia. So um, that's certainly an opportunity for some producers to look at in the Western Australian market. You'll see on this uh, graph here that basically, um, again, as I pointed out, that um, carcass is a smaller portion of our production. The Philippines takes a bit and so does Canada, but the vast majority of the um, markets are taking that six-way product. And again, it's usually more convenient for the end users in a lot of these um, countries. Um, they don't often have a lot of the handling facilities that we're accustomed to over here, so small numbers of cartons are usually sold, so it's a lot easier for them to handle those than necessarily um, full carcasses. Goat welfare, um, Campbell did touch on this a bit, but um, I suppose in addition um, we certainly would like to see um, uh, billies separated from nannies. It's going to reduce bruising and overall damage and certainly uh, give a better uh, return to the producer uh, from an over the hooks perspective. Uh, again, draft into the smaller weight classes. Uh, um, that'll assist you with, uh, again, reducing the carcass damage and, and making sure that um, the smaller animals aren't crushed. Um, dog bites, as Campbell pointed out, working dogs are uh, probably a bit of an issue, but the real issue in Western Australia are the um, wild dogs and uh, predators. Um, ultimately, if an animal is injured um, or has got a lot of dog damage on it, um, it's probably best that it's euthanized on property um, rather than being put under the truck and sent down to us. Um, taking on board Campbell's comments around curfewing, I certainly agree that animals um, need to be um, uh, sent down um, uh, having been off water, but that certainly doesn't preclude them being held um, with water and feed if it's going to take a while to get that load together. Um, they still need to maintain carcass quality and weight, um, and that'll actually be a better return for the producer at the end of the day. The um, MLA produce a great fit to load guide. Um, if you don't have it, it's a, it's a good little handy resource to keep in the, the ute glove box um, or even in in the truck, um, but certainly gives you a very straightforward guide about what can and can't be put onto a, a truck in regards to livestock, and it covers a range of livestock categories, but certainly goats are covered in there. And just at the end of the day, just remember that goats are no different to any other class of livestock you handle, so you know, there's no need to treat them any differently. You treat them, um, treat them all the same, and, and ultimately you'll, you'll get the benefit of uh, that carcasses at the end of the day. So the, the couple of take-home messages that I'd certainly like to leave everybody with is um, there is a strong and growing market for goat meat right around the world. Um, certainly if we could source goats 12 months of the year, we'd be certainly selling them. Um, and, and certainly within WA, that ongoing and consistent supply is, is certainly an issue that um, we need to address over here. Uh, know your product, know your market, know your capability. Um, drafted lots. You know, that represent the weight categories a, a processor or a buyer seeking will attract increased competition for your goats. Um, if you've got the ability to better weigh some of your goats, then you'll have a better idea about exactly what you have and what sort of prices you can expect. Know what your buyer is looking for. Talk to them about their specifications. Um, you know, it's worth your while well, um, to make sure that you really understand what they're chasing and to be sending them what they're looking for. Um, it may be that different buyers have different specifications, so you really want to make sure that you're getting the most for your goats. Um, keep your buyers updated as 
Campbell was saying in regards to the progress of how your draft and must is going, if things are starting to fall short, um, if rain's interrupted it, um, and certainly if you're starting to even get lesser numbers than what you anticipated, um, or the weights are going up or down based on the season, certainly keep your buyer updated because that will certainly influence um, how they're going to come down and, um, and how they're going to present at the, at, um, at the abattoir. Um, work together and deliver what's wanted, uh, then deliver it. It's quite often a good thing to work with the neighbours. It usually can result in sort of some larger loads coming down, some economies of scale, hopefully uh, reduce some of the costs of uh, mustering and getting, um, getting animals to market. Certainly if um, you're putting planes up for aerial mustering, it's a good way to share the cost. Again, as I said with the goat welfare, you know, the goats are no different to any other class of livestock, um, so the welfare applies equally to those goats as it does to any other animals that you handle, so you really need to understand what your responsibilities are there. And just another thing in cost reduction, you know, understand what you're costing you to, to get the goats uh, in and, and, and marketed um, and make sure that you know, the price you're receiving is a profitable one for you at the end of the day. Um, it's, you know, again, is it worth the extra cost of putting up planes, um, etc. So um, ultimately really understand what you're, what, you're, what you're doing, I suppose. Right down to the nth degree, if you can, in regards to um, dollars, dollars per hectare. And at the end of the day, look, anyone from Western Australia is welcome to, to come in and have a look at the operation. Um, you know, if you're sending goats for us particularly, we encourage anyone to come down and have a look at the operation if they do happen to be um, down our way. And um, yeah, hope uh, hope to see you soon. So thanks, Julie. Thank you, Blair. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, we do have a couple of questions which have come through and I will, sorry one second, okay. So um, in terms of the questions, uh, there was a question asked around um, approximate sort of prices that might be um, expected if, if you were looking at selling boxes or, or carcasses or, or that type of thing. Um, Blair or, or Campbell, I mean obviously that's going to depend on which market you were sending the product to. Uh, did, did you have any comments around that about I guess what products might be selling for in some of those destination markets? Campbell, Blair, I'll Campbell? let you go first. Oh, sorry. sorry, is that you? Yeah, sorry, Campbell, Blair, we just had a question. Yes, we can. Yeah, no, no problem. The, um, it, it does vary throughout the year, the prices. The, uh, as we head into the Chinese New Year, which has kind of been a, a new aspect to the business, that uh, the Chinese New Year, the prices will be increasing. As you can see, the, the prices are, are increasing for stock purchases at the moment. A lot of people trying to uh, get supply into the full Asia for that Chinese New Year. As soon as we trip over February, uh, it's a late Chinese New Year this year, so as soon as we trip over the end of February, well, they uh, pretty much turn off in China, not so much in other countries, but if they, there's a lot of factors that will affect it. If there's a, a long Northern Hemisphere winter for, the, uh, for, for America, it can affect the price. Um, I can only really talk on, on the skin-on process because skin-on goats are usually consuming quite heavily during the uh, cooler months of the year. So the, the prices will vary. Um, as for a set price, it's really hard to say, but certainly uh, we've seen over the uh, last two years the uh, livestock prices um, becoming more consistent, uh, reaching new levels that have never reached before, and uh, hopefully uh, with the cost of production with goats, uh, grazers are seeing the benefit. Yeah, look, Julie, from my perspective, I'd reiterate what Campbell said. You know, it's a supply and demand exercise, certainly in those high demand periods of the year, like Campbell was saying, around Chinese New Year and different sort of festivals in different countries. There certainly can be um, certainly um, a strong demand and, and consequently a strong push on price at those times of year. Um, but, 
we've seen overall, you know, for the last probably five plus years, the, certain, the value of the industry has, has gone up considerably, and, and certainly um, that reflects the, the high, strong demand for Australian goat meat around the world. So, so yeah, so it, it's been a very positive picture for, for the overall industry, and certainly, um, certainly again over here in Western Australia, um, its uh, supply really does dictate where the price sits. Um, and certainly, as the uh, markets start to expand, and like I said, in our regard, we, we start to get access you know, and product into China, certainly um, we'll be um, looking for um, some very good returns coming back to producers. All right, thank you both. I just had another question, and I mean, if anyone does have any additional questions for the speakers, uh, as I mentioned before, you, you can type your questions out in the question box on, on the GoToWebinar pane that should be on your computer screen there, and um, that will pop up for me to see and then ask for you. Um, I guess there was another question that came through, and it was just regards to you know the the flow of product or, or goats coming through to processes. Are you noticing? And, and I mean, we see this in in the statistics that um, Meat and Livestock Australia captures, but there is a big variance in numbers between winter and and summer. Do you have any, I guess, comments around that, and and how you know the, the effect that has, and and how that might be better managed? Um, yeah, I'll, you go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first, Campbell. Let you, yep. um, but yeah, look, ultimately in Western Australia, certainly it is very seasonal. Um, very much once you see the warmer weather come through, and that's primarily that most goats are trapped on water over here. Um, we don't have a, um, a depot uh, system like they do in the eastern states, which probably gives them a much more consistent supply of animals throughout the year. Um, that's certainly one thing that does need to be developed in Western Australia is um, getting that depot system up and going. Um, but yeah, certainly um, as the, the drier and, and warmer months come through, we certainly see a massive upswing in, um, in goats and certainly as soon as it gets cold and wet, the goats do disperse and become more difficult to muster and uh, certainly we see very few numbers coming through in those um, cooler, wetter months of the year over the side of the country. Yeah, for us, uh, we do have a depot system and we you know, depots run down to Cobar and Broken Hill and, and also run up, you know, the, the uh, run up to Mudabar and, and Blackhall and uh, Longer Reach and all that. So a lot of the theory in having those depots north and south, when it's wet in the western divisions of New South Wales, we can still source stock from the uh, northern parts of our depot, which is in Queensland. So and usually the Queensland rains in the summer and the western division rains in the winter. But as everyone knows, rain doesn't. Not everything in rain forecasts go to plan. So. Um, we look to try and get supply. We, we, it's a bigger issue for us because the only product we slaughter is, is goats. So we've really got to pull out all stops to find them and uh, and do the best job we can do by our producers so we can keep up supply all year round. Uh, but it, it is an issue. The uh, winter months, a good season for a farmer is, can be a, a rough season for a, a processor. So but usually we'll after the rain, the goats have improved. Uh, three or four months later, we're getting a bit of kilos over the scales, uh, and it all goes hand in hand. But yeah, we do have to suffer a little bit of pain during the wet seasons, but um, hopefully they can be offset by better times ahead. Okay, thank you very much, both of you. Um, well, what we might do now is proceed on to our third uh, presenter today. And as I mentioned before, uh, Mr. Ben Thomas is a Senior Market Analyst with Meat and Livestock Australia. And Ben is going to give us a bit of an overview about some of the information that Meat and Livestock Australia collects, how you can access it, and some of the trends and so forth moving forward. So uh, Ben, if you're ready to kick off, we will proceed. Uh, ben, I think you might be on, you've muted yourself, is that right? Okay, while we're waiting, we might um, just quickly talk through. We've got some information available. So both Campbell and Blair uh, mentioned uh, you know, different guidelines around transporting animals and uh, fit to load documents. So what you should be seeing on your screen at the moment is just a little bit of information about maximum time of water uh, 
etc. For, for goats and as you can see uh, those maximum time limits do vary depending on the type of animal we're talking about. More information about that is available on the Meat and Livestock Australia website as is copies of the picture load document which you should be seeing in your top uh, right hand corner of your screens at the moment uh, and that's a really handy document as Blair was talking about uh, you know just giving a good overview of do's and don'ts and so forth with fit to load. Uh, ben are you online now? Yes can you hear me now Julie? Yes I can thank you. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that I switched to the phone earlier. Okay. Um, well firstly thank you to Thank you to everyone um, who has dialed in today and, and thank you Julie for the opportunity to, to give a bit of a brief presentation here today. Um, so as Julie mentioned earlier, uh, what I'll talk about is um, I'll, I'll try and consolidate some of the things that uh, Campbell and Blair spoke about earlier and talk about some of the, the more macro trends and some of the things that we're seeing from a, from a national level rather than um, you know, a um, process of a specific level. Um, and then I'll finish off with uh, some of the market information that we produce that is um, of benefit and should be of use for, for some goat producers. So I think I just want to, and you'll have to flick through my slides, um, Julie, so if you please go to the next slide. Yep. Um, so it's a bit difficult to talk about forecasts with trends and things like that uh, without actually talking about uh, how the rainfall patterns have been for the past 12 months or so. And if you have a look at this map, it shows that the uh, virtually the red areas are where uh, rainfall has been below average to, to very much below average. And if you think back to the map that Blair had earlier showing where Australian goat meat producers are located, and you'll notice that virtually where a lot of the red is is where a lot of um, our producers are located. Um, so for that reason, we've seen a, a significant increase in, in slaughter over the past 12 months. And, in fact, goat slaughter was at a record level last year. Um, goat slaughter, uh, sorry, and with that, because 95% of what we produce gets exported, uh, goat meat exports were also at a record level. So that was in 2013. Looking forward into 20, 2014, it's looking like a number of those records are also going to be broken. Now that's a pretty encouraging sign, I think, given that you know with high slaughter, the, uh, the, the overall strong export demand has matched those levels. So if you go to the next slide, please, Julie. As, um, as Blair also mentioned earlier, about 95% of our goat production is actually rangeland. So it's quite difficult for us to forecast out any further than you know, the year ahead um, where we think uh, production and slaughter levels will be. But given how high we have been for the past eight months, given how high slaughter levels have been, uh, for the first eight months of the year, we are well and truly on track to at least equal the 2013 record. Now again, going back to, to what I mentioned earlier with um, you know, the majority of the goat population being rangeland, um, given how high the you know, five or six consecutive years there of, uh, of increases in slaughter, um, we're sort of wondering or perhaps even forecasting that there could be a dip off next year um, similar to what we saw back in 2006-2007 after a number number of consecutive years growth, um, somewhat of a drop the following year. If you go to the next slide please, Julie. In line with the increasing slaughter, we've also seen an increase in overall goat meat production. Um, again, 2013 was in fact a record year and given how high production has been this year, we're on track to beat it again. Um, now I just want to mention that that drive in production has more been driven by, in fact it's solely been driven by an increase in slaughter. Um, when I have a look at the average carcass weight of goats, it's actually remained flat for the past 20 odd years. It hasn't really moved around too much. So I think you know, if, um, now if we do start to see a greater infusion of boar goats into the rangeland herd or flock, um, there's every chance that the uh, production could increase even though, uh, even if we do see a decline in slaughter. Um, if you go to the next slide please, Julie. With our exports last year, record year, um, again 2014, very, very strong demand. And as you can see, the value has also been increasing uh, in line with that great, those greater volumes that we've been sending overseas. Um, you know, 
we're going to be uh, the Australian dollar hasn't really been in our favour over the period of that um, of that uh, chart. But given the Aussie dollar um, is forecast to decline somewhat this year, I mean it already has come back down slightly uh, from where it was in 2013. Uh, it's only going to make our product uh, put our product in a more favourable position um, in the international market. And Campbell touched on earlier some of the free trade agreements that haven't yet been ratified but are in the pipeline, and um, a, a lot of people are they're forecast to be finished um, or finalised by the end of this year, uh, if not early next year. Um, so you know, it's quite encouraging to see that with 95% of what we produce getting exported, um, those export volumes going up in line with the, with the increased slaughter and production levels. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Julie. Um, Blair also touched on how the form of, uh, and so did Campbell, how the form of our, um, you know, what we export is, is exported. Uh, and now Blair did mention that the most majority of what they export is in the six-way cut. Well, that, Nationally, uh, most of what we, we export is actually in the carcass form. And, and we do export to a range of markets. We saw a small portfolio uh, pie chart that Blair put up. Uh, but our largest export market and consistently our largest goat meat export destination is North America. Um, you know, we're forecast to send 35,000 tonnes of goat meat overseas this year. Uh, and as you can see, 20,000 of those tonnes are going to go to North America, uh, with the US being the largest market. Um, the majority of what we of the goat that we export actually uh, to to North America actually ends up in that northeastern corner, uh, where there's a fairly diverse ethnic population. So that's just one large market, and that is quite a large market. But on top of uh, on top of the U.S. and Canada, we've got Taiwan, where we consistently send about 4,000 tons. Um, the Caribbean, we send around 2,000 tons there each year. Um, and the balance of it, the majority of the balance ends up somewhere in Southeast Asia. If you go to the next slide, please, Julie. Uh, on top of slaughter, we've of course got the live goat exports as well. Um, as you can see, it's been a little bit more volatile uh, over the past 15 or 20 years. Um, but you know, overall, we export around 70,000 head of goats each year, with a fairly volatile value in line with the volumes that we've been or the numbers we've been exporting. Um, most of these actually end up in Malaysia. In fact, 99% of our live goat exports end up in Malaysia. Um, and even though it is such a low figure, uh, when you put when you look at our overall turn off um, live exports on top of the slaughter. Um, overall, goat turnoff has been increasing fairly steadily um, for the past 15 years or so. That's despite the, or taking into account the, the fairly volatile live numbers. Now, the other interesting thing too about the live goat exports is that the majority of them, in fact, come from New South Wales. Um, of those 75,000 head that we're about to export overseas, or what we exported last year, uh, around 45 of those came from New South Wales uh, and around 25 out of South Australia. So it's it's much more of a, an east coast um, you know, focus. Go to the next slide, please, Julie. And just finally on the um, on the supply and demand situation, uh, I've just taken the eastern states over the hook, 16 to 20 kilo um, price as an indicator. And given that really strong demand that we've had, uh, the prices of goats since the beginning of 2013 have, in fact, been uh, steadily increasing, which is which is a very positive sign for the industry. Um, and if we go back a couple of slides and think back to how high slaughter has been, um, and despite that increase in slaughter, uh, we've seen some steady growth in prices. Now, if we look at the cattle situation um, as, a, as an example of uh, where slaughter has also been quite high and the demand is quite strong, but, because, um, but it hasn't quite flowed through to, to prices as well as what it appears to have with, um, with goat meat. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Julie. Uh, the final part of the presentation I wanted to talk about was just some of the market information that um, MLA has available and is of relevance for goat producers. Uh, so we have a fortnightly uh, Goats on the Move e-newsletter, uh, uh, which covers a whole host of things, including what exports have been doing to the various markets, what slaughter has been doing, and then also what the eastern states' uh, indicative prices have that we have, what they're doing, what the movements are there as well. We've recently released a market information app, um, so it's it's free to download um, from the App Store uh, for all um, 
uh, on any type of um, smartphone device, and you can tailor the reports that you receive or the information that you look at on the, on the app. Um, we've got the Meat and Livestock Weekly, which also covers off on the slaughter and production statistics for uh, the Australian goat industry. Um, on an annual basis, we put out a, a summary of what's happened over the past 12 months. Um, it's a good sort of 18 to 20 page document that goes into uh, into a fair bit of detail actually uh, what cuts we're sending to various markets, what slaughter's been doing. Um, and unfortunately, given the uh, significant population that is rangeland, it is a little bit more too difficult to, to put forward forecasts, um, but uh, it, it does give you a good overview of what has happened for the past 12 months. Um, and of course, we've got over the hooks price reports as well. Uh, so the next slide, Julie. Um, so if anyone would like to sign up to any of that information or receive any further statistics um, that MLA produce, um, please feel free to shoot me an email, uh, which you can see there, bthomas.mla.com.au, or, or give me a call. Um, or alternatively, uh, there's the National Livestock Reporting Service. If you flick them an email uh, or give them a call, calls or emails um, and thank you again for everyone that's dialed in and listened and uh, thanks for the opportunity to have a chat Julie. Thank you very much Ben. Um, we did have one question uh, coming through and it was just with regard to the type of uh, statistics, report information that uh, NLRS produced. Obviously you had um, back on the previous slide all of those you know different reports and so forth there that are readily available with and produced regularly. If someone was asked for a bit more detail, perhaps some customised information, is that possible to to order or request? The, certainly, Julie. Uh, flick either myself or the NRS um, email um, <laughs> um, address and email, and um, yeah, we can pull that data out. We've got a very detailed uh, database with. Uh, various cuts to various markets. Uh, we can break it down to chilled, frozen. Um, so yeah, that, that sort of stuff is, uh, is available on request. Okay, excellent. And if someone had some suggestions around other, I guess, reports that perhaps they think would be useful for people to regularly sign up to, is, is that something they can discuss with yourself as well? Yeah, certainly, certainly. Always uh, um, welcome any feedback, uh, all feedback. Um, and are always looking to improve the uh, the reporting that we do and the and the services that we provide. So yes, please, um, more than happy to have a chat with uh, with with whoever's got some suggestions. Okay, great, thank you. Well, um, we do have a couple of other questions coming through, and what I might do is uh, open open that up to to all of the presenters today to. Uh, discuss. Uh, one of the questions was just around um, how the products are used in some of those export markets. Um, for example, if, if the US and China are the major markets that goat meat products are being exported to, do they use those differently and, and how would they most commonly be used? Um, Julie Oliver, I'll have a first go at that one. Um, it, it, goat meat basically does feed the masses. It, it's very much a meat that's eaten widely by a very broad um, and diverse ethnic range of people around the world. So it gets prepared in a whole lot of different ways. Um, if you look at the China market, it's usually going into a lot of hot pots and, and those sorts of dishes. Um, whereas in the um, a lot of other places in the world, it usually gets cubed up and put into a lot of curries and stews and those types of um, preparations, a lot of wet cooking. Um, right through into the states where um, even the Hispanic population over there uses, uh, usually shreds the meat and puts it into tortillas and, and what have you. So um, it's a very diverse and versatile meat that can be used in a number of ways, um, but certainly um, it is primarily wet cooked um, in, in, like I said, curries and stews by, um, by the majority of people who are using it, but certainly very, very versatile meat. Okay. Ben and Campbell, did you have any comments to add? No, I agree very much with what he said. The, uh, 
the uh, cooking processes really rely on the, the ethnic base of the people buying the products uh, in, in China and southern China are very heavy on the skin on product. They have a different way of doing the hot pot to the people in the north, different flavours they will use. Uh, the Taiwanese will cook it a little bit different uh, and Shang people in Shanghai will use it for meat in dumplings. The, uh, a lot of the Mexican based people in America will use it in, in wet cooking in the cubes, uh, in the Caribbeans we also use a lot of the burnt goats as well, for the, uh, which will give them a different flavour, they also use it in the wet cooking, so yeah, it's really based on the origins of the, of the people buying the meat. Okay. And uh, just had a question um, for Blair and Campbell, uh, would you be able to quickly recap the, the weight ranges, your preferred weight ranges for or for the animals that uh, you're receiving? Well, well, for us, similar to what Blair said before, I'm pretty sure he said his weight ranges were a dress weight above 10 kilos. It's the same as what we are. Uh, 10 kilos, anything above there is fine. We can do skin on, you know, skin on up to you know, up to 24, 25 kilos dress. So we have no concern of any any size, just as long as they're large enough not to be of commercial value. And the more weight that you send in on your goat, the more dollars in your pocket, so that's where we are. Yeah, look, certainly um, we're much the same, Julie, from our perspective, yes, they, they need to be over that 10 kilo carcass weight. Um, and ultimately, yeah, um, there's really no upper size limit. Um, we've certainly got markets for all, all range of size of goat carcasses. Um, but certainly, as Campbell said, the more weight and the better you look after the animal, the less damage on the carcasses, um, the more return is going to be for the producer at the end of the day. But Certainly, you know, if, if producers are looking to get a bit more competition on their lines, certainly we see over here that um, if they can sort of split the, the under 34 kilo live weight or the smaller goats away from the larger over 34 kilo live weight goats, um, certainly is um, advantageous to both us and the producer. Thank you. Uh, Campbell, there's a question for you in relation to the, the photo that's on the screen at the moment, the skin on brown carcass. Mm, beautiful. <laughs> yes, well, you want to know how we do it? Well, we, just a bit of explanation around what that is how, yes. and how that came about. How it came about. Well, traditionally, if you think of the goat as the, uh, the hairiest animal that we eat skin on, uh, so all this hair must be removed. So if you go back, say, a thousand years when people were working at how they cooked the goats, the, uh, some people, countries are similar to ours, they decide to rip the hides off or rip the skins off. So you end up with a skin off product. Some countries were traditional pork eaters or they, they did the same as pork, they threw in the scalding tub, they rolled it and, and shaved the hair off. And some other countries they decided to throw it in the fire and, 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 and scald the hair off, singe it off. So um, some nations, a lot of African nations have grown up with that what's called a, like a smoky flavour in that meat. And they, uh, a lot of people in the Caribbean or in, in North America still ch chase that flavour. It's something they've grown up with over the years. and. Uh, it's basically come about from a removal of hair and, and it, now it's a, a flavour they like to continue. But we obviously don't throw on the fire. We, uh, we sit it with a, uh, a propane torch. It only just lightly sears the skin, and, but it doesn't actually cook the meat at all. Okay, thank you. And with regard to the photo that um, has popped up uh, now, the bagged cubed goat, yes. What's the story behind that? Well, all our products, we can do the cube. So we can do a, a skin-on cube, a brown skin-on cube, or we can do, if we are doing skin-off, we can do a skin-off cube. The, these products that we do for uh, straight to the supermarket shelves into America, places like Costco's, some of you might have heard of, they buy our, um, our cubes. They, they approached us a few years ago about uh, giving them a product that would suit the customer so the housewife would come in, buy one bag of kilo cubes, uh, take it home and just drop it in, in, into the water and start doing a wet cook. So it came about for a, a demand uh, in the US and it's a, uh, certainly a product that we continue to supply. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, look, I think that's actually it in terms of uh, questions coming through from the audience. Again, I'd like to thank everyone very much for their time today and dialling in for the webinar. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our three guest speakers uh, for the time that you, you have uh, contributed to today's webinar.
We mentioned quickly before there is some information around transport guidelines, fit to load guidelines on the Meat and Livestock Australia website. Uh, so that is available there for people if you'd like to follow up and get some more information around that. I'd also like to take this opportunity to let everyone know that we do have a series of events uh, coming up in the coming months for goat producers. So uh, you'll see towards the bottom of the table there we do have two more webinars that are scheduled, uh, one for October and one for November. Uh, so those again are freely available to anyone who would like to register and, um, and listen in to those. And again, as we did today, the webinars will be recorded and uploaded to the Meat Livestock Australia website. We do have a stroke producer forum, uh, two coming up, one in Charleville next week between 9 and 11 at the Charleville RSL in Queensland. That will be an opportunity for producers to get, uh, I guess, a better understanding of some of the different uh, products uh, projects that are running at the moment funded through goat levies uh, and have import into the future of those. How, what are the future investment priorities that people would like to see happening? Uh, we do have an industry strategic plan we're developing at the moment. So it's a really good opportunity to come along uh, to that forum and the one at Bendigo in Victoria on the 17th of October to, I guess, get an opportunity to, to hear some of those presentations, meet some of the representatives from the Goat Industry Council of Australia and, and it's an opportunity to provide that input. We do have also two uh, goat focused uh, meat, red meat producer workshops which the Red Meat Advisory Council is running. Again, one in Charleville on Wednesday next week and one in Broken Hill on the 9th of October. Both of those are open to producers, sheep, cattle and goat producers and it is an opportunity to provide some input into the direction and, and and I guess help identify some of the challenges for the industry going forward for the next five or so years. Uh, they haven't run these sorts of workshops previously in, in regional areas, so it's, they're really trying to get that, um, that regional input and feedback and make it as easy as possible for producers to have that input. There's an Ag Force 360 event happening in Charleville uh, next week as well. And uh, we do have a commercial goat industry field day happening in Condobolin in New South Wales uh, in October. If you did have any questions with regards to the, the goat producer forums or, or the, uh, the Red Meat Advisory Council sessions, um, please feel free to get in touch with myself or, or contact someone uh, from the Goat Industry Council of Australia via their website. Um, and what we might do is we just might have one other question. Um, Felicity, uh, if you're around, I will, I'll just unmute you and see if you did have a question for the speakers. See there, Felicity? Oh, hi, Julie. I had it typed in there. I wasn't sure if you were getting my comments. Oh, sorry. That. I must have missed that. Yep. It's all right. I was just wondering, um, if any of you can see the industry improving as a whole, sort of across, I guess, all levels of the supply chain with the increased demand overseas, um, or will it be held up by supply issues? And also, can you see the demand increasing for goat meat here in Australia? Okay, thank you, Felicity. What I might do is I'll just uh, put you back on mute um, just to limit that background noise. And um, we'll see if, if any of the um, speakers would like to respond to that. Yes, the, uh, I can comment first on that one, Julie. Okay. Yep. Yep. So I, I just want to say, I suppose over the last 18 months or so, uh, given the steadily increasing uh, indicative prices uh, for goat meat, even with the higher slaughter, that paints a pretty promising picture for just how high. Um, you know, how strong the demand is and how strong it is likely to remain for our product. Um, I can't see, given that only 5% of what we produce is consumed here in Australia, I can't see a massive increase, well, I can't see an increase in, um, uh, in demand in Australia having as great a impact or influence on, on goat meat prices as what would happen um, uh, with greater demand from, from the overseas markets. Does uh, Blair or Campbell want to add to that? Yeah, I agree with that, Ben. Uh, it's definitely uh, all, uh, everything we do is export here and everything is, if we supplied the uh, Sydney or Brisbane market for one week, it'd probably be flooded out for uh, two months. So 
it's certainly a very small market for us, and uh, there's enough domestic processes doing it. Um, but it, what's happening over, overseas what, with the increased interest from Asian nations and uh, also India and uh, America being put under a little, little bit more pressure as far as the purchasing power as they used to have, they now have a bit more competition. Um, they used to be the, the bit of the, the price dictator for the for the ghost, but now they have uh, competition from our Asian neighbours and uh, they're having to step up to the mark and meet their demands with, with new prices. So uh, the future for export goat is bright as long as we can uh, maintain supply, which is probably more more of the issue is the supplies coming in through all year um, and uh, a consistent supply is probably the trick. Is it, go is it all sustainable in the end? And uh, the more people who are going in the goats and look at their uh, ability and cost of production uh, and as it goes as an attractive alternative, um, you know, the better the industry is going to be. Yeah, look, Julie, from my perspective, um, certainly reiterate what both Ben and um, and Campbell have said. The demand overseas, as we well know, is just increasing continually, um, and supply will always be our biggest issue. Um, you know, I, I think that um, a lot of producers need to sort of come to terms with the, the benefits of running goats on a lot of these properties, and particularly uh, not just solely within the, the pastoral regions. I think there's a lot of um, uh, sort of uh, cross benefits between particularly cattle and producers and goats um, that essentially um, you know, goats can quite often be run um, to break parasite uh, cycles. They can be used to manage a lot of woody weeds in a lot of country that's now um, been choked out by those sorts of things. Um, certainly um, they can, by the nature of their browsing rather than grazing, not really add a lot of uh, uh, grazing pressure to some country. So um, they can be can be quite a good complementary um, livestock source to particularly the cattle industry. And so I think there's a lot of things that need to be uh, sort of espoused about the goat and, and its positive benefits because certainly there's a massive market out there and, and we, we cannot keep up with it. Um, if, like I said, at least from the West Australian perspective, um, if we could have goats 20, uh, 12 months of the year, we would certainly be selling them 12 months of the year. Um, but certainly supply is, is always going to be the ongoing issue for the Australian goat industry. Thank you. Um, we just had a couple of other questions which we might quickly um, move through. So, uh, in terms of farm goats, boars, Kalahari reds, are they placed into a different market than, for example, the rangeland animals? Um, I'll probably start on that one. Certainly the, the boar goat and the Kalahari red um, usually carry a lot more condition and they do carry a, a lot more muscling as well. They're a much bigger carcass and, and certainly a lot more uh, fat coverage on them. They do actually suit probably more the domestic scene. Um, that's a, a, a carcass um, that um, really does uh, go well into the domestic um, market and certainly the ways of domestic sort of styles of cooking for roasting and barbecuing and, and those sorts of um, cooking methods. Um, but in saying that too, yes, at our export level we have had some small inquiry around um, utilising uh, particularly crossbred carcasses, not just purebred boar or Kalahari, but certainly crossbred carcasses, and I think that's probably where the industry needs to look at is um, in implementing some of these genetic advantages into alongside with the, um, the current rangeland um, animal, um, because certainly yes, in some of our export uh, carcass markets, the chilled carcass markets, certainly are looking for an animal that's um, got a bit more conformation to it, a bit more muscling to it, um, but certainly fat coverage is the one thing that we need to really watch in all of our markets. We find with a lot of our customers, um, the, the, the Australian range and goat being the, the breed that they want, the, uh, they come through the plant and they look at the uh, carcasses and the first thing we want to show them is behind that skin on there is a very lean meat and uh, that's what separates us away from, from the mutton and the lamb, is the leanness of our goats and uh, it's something we, you know, the, Australian goat population, you know, and then people should be proud of the, the, the product they've already got. There's a very vigor, high and vigor goat who reproduces well, it uh, handles conditions well, it survives well, there's semi arid conditions, uh, low cost of production. Um, so but we've, we've got the goat already in our breed that we've, uh, we, which our majority of our markets want. And uh, um, yeah, I think a lot of the, the dabbling into uh, too much ball cross or can go too far. I think a little bit goes is well, but 
we've got to be careful that the, the market's there for what we've got. So I think I think there's a, it always is an area that we can add a bit more weight into the goats, but uh, to have uh, an animal that can cover country well and, and survive in these semi-arid semi conditions, and um, you know we've got it. So let's keep giving it to them. Great, thank you. And uh, two more very quick questions. Uh, is there much instance of cheesy gland in Australia? And if so, what is the impact? I'll go this one. The, uh, yep. the goats are very low in um, the pathology. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, condemn as far as certain cheesy glands. There is a certain amount of CLAs which come I into goats. There's very low number. Um, they're, they're very clean on the parasites. They're very clean on the cheesy gland. But there, it is, there is a small percentage, but it's very, very rare for us. Okay. Yeah, much the same for us too. Um Julia, that uh, just the nature of the areas that these goats are coming from in the rangeland areas and the pastoral areas that um, they are a very um, sort of healthy animal in most cases because a lot of cases the sick ones haven't come in basically so it's just by uh, by nature purely where they come from and, and how they run that um, ultimately the animals you you get to see are usually the ones that are in much better condition. Yeah, well we have we have two government inspectors standing there checking off all daily and checking carcasses for these type of things. And uh, by the end of a week, you can, you can see in their eyes they're quite bored of the job that they've just done. But it's part of the requirement by the government that all animals must be checked for uh, the, the, these issues. And uh, the goat uh, DAF inspectors or the government inspectors have a, a quite an easy job of the day. Mm. And it's probably also certainly an aspect, Julie, that our markets um, expect from Australia. That's the one. That's one of the very good competitive advantages that we've got overseas. That 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 our, our product is, is seen very much as a, a clean product. Um, there are no health issues um, or disease issues with it that, um, because of the, the selection, um, both naturally from where the animals are coming from, but also too because of the high range of um, inspection that's put on um, export advertisers like ourselves and, um, and Charleville, that certainly um, you know, the product coming out is, is second to none. Uh, it's the best in the world without a problem. Excellent, thank you. And just one final question, and this is a quickie. Uh, a 10 kg carcass, what would that be in live weight? Depends where you go. If you, yeah. yeah, if we do uh, a 10 kilo, because we our yields can, with a skin on job can be quite high and very you know, can get into the 50%, so it's quite easy. Matt, so doing a, a 10 is, is around that 21, uh, um, because the majority of the goats will get close. If the goat is in good buckle, it, it will get that. So. But um, if you're doing a skin off, it might be up towards and add another four or five kilos you need a 26 27 yeah no I'd agree certainly it's um at a skin off level it's it's in that high 20s um, heading towards 30 um, so we normally as a general sort of tell producers to try and um, keep them above a, a 30 kilo live weight that certainly um you know it's just a, a bit of a general rule um, but give or take around that number you, you're pretty right if you, you want to pick up a fat kelpie dog you, you're about got it <laughs> yeah exactly yep <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much uh, everyone. Uh, look, as you can see all the different events are listed there on the on the screen at the moment. Uh, most of those are on the Meat and Livestock Australia website, the events page, so you can find more information and register for those there. Uh, and once again, thank you very much to everyone who has um, participated in the webinar today and thank you to our guest speakers. Um, We'll look forward to seeing you all at the next couple of webinars. Thank you, everyone.